All right. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can see me. I'm just going to type in the chat that we're live now uh, as I multitask now. Um, I'm Stephen Spark, along with my wife, I, uh, the owner of Point Reyes Books in Point Reyes Station, California, you know, about an hour northwest of Berkeley, hour north of San Francisco, and one of the most beautiful places in California. I feel so lucky that we not only own this little amazing bookstore, but we also get to host events like this with Kim Stanley Robinson, who has been a favorite for a long time, and uh, and the great Robin Sloan, one of the most fun writers and an amazing moderator. I was so happy that we could pull this off tonight. So thank you both for being here tonight, as well as everybody in the audience for tuning in from across the country, it looks like, in the roll call here in the chat. Um, I just want to welcome you all. I want to point out that there is the chat function. We have a question box below us here. Um, so we will be, uh, Stan will be answering some audience questions. So please use that function. And and those of you in the audience, please use the vote function there and it'll move the questions that seem to be of more interest uh, to the top. And we'll do our best to try to get to as much of them as we can, of course. Um, a couple of quick things, you know, we're at the mercy of our Wi-Fi connections and various, you know, streaming capabilities and uh, ways that, you know, Things that can go wrong often do go wrong, but we're hoping for a glitch-free uh, event tonight. Sometimes cameras cut out. If it's a little glitchy for you, maybe move closer to your router, uh, close some other tabs and things, you know, various, you know, you can do the whole uh, kick it and restart it or whatever. <laughs> we also are recording, so this will be available for replay later on. We'll keep it here and also we'll load it onto YouTube. Um, we got the questions, so again, questions below. For, please use that to ask uh, anything you're, you're dying to know. Uh, the, the first question I do want to point out was someone asking about spoilers. So maybe, we, you know, I'll leave that to the, the two conversationalists to best to manage that. Um, a couple of quick things we have coming up. Uh, tomorrow at noon, um, Tim Hartford is in conversation with um, Randall Monroe, the creator of XKCD, about, his, uh, about Tim's new book, Data Detective. And then on February 24th, we're hosting Lydia Millet, who will be talking about her novel, A Children's Bible, which uh, was one of the 10 best novels of the year last year, according to the New York Times. Later this spring, we have pioneering biologist and uh, forest ecologist Suzanne Samard, uh, Jonathan Meberg, who many of you might know from his music career in Oakerville River and Shearwater, will be discussing his new book about walking falcons. Totally interesting social falcon, new to me, um, but a great book, really exuberant and a lot of fun. Uh, later this spring, Susan Bernofsky uh, joins us um, from New York to talk about her long awaited biography of the great Swiss modernist writer, Robert Walser, among others. You see many of the listings on our Crowdcast and you can follow us here to get updates as we go live on these things or sign up to our newsletter on our website. With that, I'm just gonna introduce our two distinguished guests tonight and I'm gonna get out of the way. I'll be monitoring things, as I said, throughout the chat, so um, throughout the event. So feel free to uh, drop any questions um, for me, particularly in the chat um, and for Stan and Robin in the questions. So again, Robin Sloan, uh, I love your bio, it's so modest. Uh, Robin Sloan grew up in Michigan and now splits his time between, well, the East Bay, I guess, and the internet. Um, he's the author, of course, of Mis Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore and most recently Sourdough. He also recently, I don't know how long ago this is, you can tell us because time is doing funny things these days, uh, wrote, published a serial uh, in a couple of newspapers, the Mercury, New Mercury News and the East Bay Times uh, called The Strange Case of the New Golden Gate, which is really excellent and a lot of fun. You can actually find the whole thing on his website now. And of course, uh, the reason we're gathered here tonight, Kim Stanley Robinson is a prolific novelist, um, one of our great novelists. I don't even want to throw a genre in there because it's beyond genre to me. Um, uh, Stan has won the Hugo, the Nebula, and the Locust Awards. He's the author of 20 novels, including the best-selling Mars trilogy, the critically acclaimed 40 Signs of Rain, 50 Degrees Below, 60 Days in County, Counting, The Years of Rice and Salt, and of course, Antarctica. In 2008, he was named a Hero of the Environment by Time Magazine. Um, and has recently joined the Sequoia Parks Foundation Artists in the Backcountry program. Uh, and Stan lives in Davis, California. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over. Uh, Stan's gonna do a little reading for us before the conversation starts. Thank you all again for joining us tonight. Um, I'll pop back on at the end just to say good night, but um, until then, I'm gonna hand it over. Well, thank you for that, uh, Stephen. And thank you, uh, Point Reyes Books. Thank you for everybody checking in. Um, I am going to read very briefly just to give people a um, a flavor 
of the Ministry for the Future, three s small segments that I hope will total just a, a, you know, five minutes or so. So it's just a, a way of uh, giving a taste of the book. And so in that, um, in pursuit of that, I'll start at the very beginning. It was getting hotter. Frank May got off his mat and padded over to look out the window. Umber stucco walls and tiles, the color of the local clay. Square apartment blocks like the one he was in. Rooftop patios occupied by residents who had moved up there in the night, it being too hot to sleep inside. Now quite a few of them were standing behind their chest-high walls looking east. Sky the color of the buildings, mixed with white where the sun would soon rise. Frank took a deep breath. It reminded him of the air in a sauna. This, the coolest part of the day. In his entire life, he had spent less than five minutes in saunas. He didn't like the sensation. Hot water, maybe. Hot, humid air. No. He didn't see why anyone would seek out such a stifling, sweaty feeling. Here, there was no escaping it. He wouldn't have agreed to come here if he had thought it through. It was his hometown sister city, but there were other sister cities, other aid organizations. He could have worked in Alaska. Instead, sweat was dripping into his eyes and stinging. He was wet, wearing only a pair of shorts. Those two were wet. There were wet patches on his mat where he'd tried to sleep. He was thirsty, and the jug by his bedside was empty. All over town, the stressed hum of window box air conditioners, fans, buzzed like giant mosquitoes. And then the sun cracked the eastern horizon. It blazed like an atomic bomb, which of course it was. The fields and buildings underneath that brilliant chip of light went dark, and then darker still as the chip flowed to the sides in a burning line that then bulged to a crescent he couldn't look at. The heat coming from it was palpable, a slap to the face. Solar radiation heating the skin of his face, making him blink. Stinging eyes flowing, he couldn't see much. Everything was tan and beige in a brilliant, unbearable white. An ordinary town in Uttar Pradesh, 6 a.m. He looked at his phone, 38 degrees. In Fahrenheit, that was, he tapped, 103 degrees. Humidity, about 35 or 40 percent. The combination was the thing. A few years ago, it would have been among the hottest wet bulb temperatures ever recorded. Now, just a Wednesday morning. Wails of dismay cut the air coming from the rooftop across the street. Cries of distress, a pair of young women leaning over the wall, calling down to the street. Someone on that roof was not waking up. Frank tapped at his phone, called the police. No answer. He couldn't tell if the call had gone through or not. Sirens now cut the air, sounding distant and as if somehow submerged. With the dawn, people were discovering sleepers in distress, finding those who would never wake up from the long, hot night, calling for help. The sirens seemed to indicate some of the calls had worked. Frank checked his phone again, charged, showing a connection, but no reply at the police station. He had had occasion to call several times in his four months here. Two months to go. 58 days. Way too long. July 12th, monsoon not yet arrived. Focused on getting through today one day at a time, then home to Jacksonville, comically cool after this. He would have stories to tell, but the poor people on the rooftop across the way. And then the sound of the air conditioners cut off. Be it resolved that a subsidiary body authorized by this 29th conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the parties to the Paris Climate Agreement is hereby established to work with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and all the agencies of the United Nations and all the governments signatory to the Paris Agreement to advocate for the world's future generations of citizens whose rights as defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are as valid as our own. This new subsidiary body is furthermore charged with defending all living creatures, present and future, who cannot speak for themselves by promoting their legal standing and physical protection. Someone in the press named this new agency the Ministry for the Future, and the name stuck and spread and became what the new agency was usually called. It was established in Zurich, Switzerland. And not long after that, the big heat wave struck India. The book has um, several, I guess, riddles in it. There's a lot of forms in this novel, um, a play of forms, but the riddles are, well, here's one. Everyone knows me, but no one can tell me. No one knows me, even though everyone has heard my name. 
Everyone talking together makes something that seems like me, but is not me. Everyone doing things in the world makes me. I am blood in the streets, the catastrophe you can never forget. I am the tide running under the world that no one sees or feels. I happen in the present, but I'm told only in the future. And then they think they speak of the past, but really they are always speaking about the present. I do not exist, and yet I am everything. You know what I am. I am history. Now make me good. Okay, I'll stop with that. Kim Stanley Robinson, it's almost as if you're somehow intimately familiar with the contents of this book because a person could hardly choose a better uh, sort of, uh, you know, prefix to, to give people a sampling. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. I'm talking with you about this book here at the beginning of the trembling 20s. Um, and uh, thank you to Point Ray's Books and uh, everybody who's tuned in to watch this. I think this is just a absolute dream of a conversation in the right time um, and the right context to be having it in. Um, also, I want to point out, uh, speaking of the time that we're in, we have some party hoppers in the audience, you know, who've come over here from another Powell's live stream event. What an amazing new affordance for these uh, for these, <laughs> these live book events. You could not have just wandered over from Portland. So uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome to the to the party hoppers. Um, okay, so this so this book, as as you all understand now, um, based on that reading, um, is this intellectual thriller. I mean, it's really a planetary scale intellectual thriller. It starts in 2025, the very near future, and gallops for a couple of decades, um, tracing the path, the not at all straightforward um, path of this organization called the Ministry for the Future. And there's a lot I want to talk about the book and questions I want to ask about its writing and its craft, but actually just to, to focus on the content, because it's, it is actually really serious, urgent content, um, and particularly for the benefit of people who have not read the book yet in the in the audience, um, I want to just actually expand, ask you, Stan, to expand a little bit on that first chapter, um, which makes this very tangible, urgent argument to the reader, um, just to, I don't know, convince them that they're reading the right book. It seemed to me to say, this really matters. Like, this heat matters. Um, you have this scene of a heat wave in, in India, and I don't want you to recapitulate the whole thing, because you obviously took your time writing it very carefully. But could you actually take just a moment and explain to us the, the what is the danger, the great danger um, of the the wet bulb 35? Like what is what that is in the human body? Sure, and and thanks Robin for all this. Um, it's a it's known to everybody already. It's simply the combination of heat and humidity, uh, and this is something that everybody who's lived in various parts of the United States knows that uh, humid heat is much harder to handle than dry heat. So, and also when it's hum humid, it tends to knock down the temperature. And, and so the hottest temperatures that are experienced usually dry out the air and then the human body can handle that by sweating. I had been reading a lot of um, commentary that prided themselves on being adaptationists and were um, a little sanguine, I guess you would say, about the idea that we're not going to be able to keep the global average temperatures down below two degrees centigrade Celsius like uh, is recommended by the IPCC and the 1.5, where we're already at 1.2 or 1.3, that holding it to 1.5 is almost impossible to, maybe hard, maybe we'll go to three, maybe we'll go to four. And these people were suggesting, so what? We'll just adapt. Humans are adaptable and it's gonna happen. We can't stop it. These were mm, uh, humanities people or economists. And then the physical scientists were uh, beginning to point out that at wet bulb 35, which would, let's say it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity, at that point, the body starts to overheat because your sweating doesn't work. You could be naked indoors and have a fan on you. You would still overheat and die within hours. And a wet bulb 34 was hit in Chicago in 1995. In the Persian Gulf, they hit wet bulb 35s. The rising global average heat is going to cook up places, mainly in the tropics, but not always in the tropics where uh, we're going to hit temperatures where humans who aren't in air conditioning 
are going to die within hours. It's as bad as hypothermia. Hyperthermia is as bad as hypothermia. We have a narrow range. And sweating is what keeps us from overheating. And it doesn't work uh, when it gets hot enough and humid enough. And we're headed that way. And at that point, this whole adaptation argument fell apart. And the radical danger of the situation that we're in right now kind of slapped me in the face. And that was really the the origin of this book. I I said to myself, I've got to write this. I've got to tell this story. I feel frightened that something like this is going to happen. And that will be the first flag of people that were in this radical danger. The the urgency comes across on the page and it really, that I think is the engine that then kind of pulls you into the rest of it. It's grim information, um, frightening information. At the same time, it's information, um, and like anything that has to do with science and biology and how bodies work and how ecologies work, it's interesting. Um, and I noted um, both in your kind of formulation of, of wet bulb 35, many characters talk about it over the course of the book, and, and a lot of other things. Um, there's something that really surprised me, and I actually ended up saying this very often to people when I was recommending the book, as I did many times in the fall, um, that it's, it's very didactic, surprisingly didactic. And I mean that in the sense of it teaches. And uh, I think, I could be wrong, but I think there's a conventional wisdom that says fiction should not be didactic. Like, no, 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 you need to, you need to sneak it in. You know, you have to kind of like tuck the pills into the dog food and trick people into learning stuff, especially like gnarly science stuff. Um, but you don't do that. I mean, you just go straight at it. There's whole sections where you just teach us things. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious to know, what do you, maybe the conventional wisdom is wrong. Um, this book sure makes me feel like it must be, but um, what do you think of that? And were you conscious of that, of that technique? Yes, I understand completely. I, I mean, I'm already notorious, I guess I would say, within my community as the great scoffer at the idea that you have to slip the pill into the dog food. Um, and um brecht is very good on this Bertolt brecht um he talks about some of his plays he names uh Lehren Stuka, learning pieces um and all of his plays have that estrangement effect the v effect of of um pulling you outside of the sense that you're just in the dream that fiction wants to put you in and uh, pulls you out and makes you think about the thing that you're watching and Brecht would always reference Aristotle that education and entertainment is a false dichotomy, that in essence, education ought to be entertaining and that entertainment is often most entertaining when it's educational. So that, uh, um, I mean, I've, for me, it's been the question of science fiction as an odd thing that's trying to talk about science and therefore has exposition. It isn't just stage business. It does its, um, uh, in, there, there, there was a stylistic rule in science fiction that was introduced by Heinlein. Pretend as if you're talking to an audience of that future time. You don't get to explain anything. You slip it in in little snippets along the way. The cleverness of that is one of the pleasures of reading a science fiction text. What is this future like? And you intuit it by little, um, uh, snippets of information that are slipped in naturally as opposed to the dreaded expository lump. So I am the monster of the midway. I am the guy who, and this is 30 years ago in Red Mars, said uh, to hell with that. I like uh, the expository lump. I'm not even going to call it that. That's a stupid title. Not to mention the dismissive um, info dump. I'm going to dump until you die and you're going to like it anyway. So that's been a, a 30 year project and the ministry is kind of the culmination of that because there's a play of forms and there's all kinds of texts. There's 106 chapters and, and indeed the material is grim, right? Especially at the beginning when we realize the danger that we're in as a civilization and it's like, Oh God, do I want to read this novel? It's like taking medicine, this, you know, Robinson, why does he do this to me? Well, it's gotta be fun. It's still gotta be entertainment. And part of that is the play of forms. And so amongst the forms, you have 
um, the diary, the diary entry or the notes from a meeting or a dialogue between two radio uh, characters or um, an essay or a dictionary entry, et cetera, et cetera. So when you start a chapter, you don't know what kind of text you're reading. Within two or three sentences, you get it and on you go. But that was one way of making it more fun. Um, <laughs> I, I will kind of tip my hand at this point in our conversation. I will say that my, my overarching goal for, for our part of this before we get to the questions is, um, uh, honestly and, and selfishly, I would like to learn how to be more of a Kim Stanley Robinson, um, to see not the future, but the, but the present with this kind of clarity and urgency and, and curiosity. Um, and I suspect that's something that people tuned in would also like to do or become. Uh, you said before um, that you're more a reporter than an idea guy, and uh, if that's true, I'm curious to know where would you say you are reporting from? Um, what do you read? Who do you talk to? Um, what, what are your sources? Yeah, thanks for that. That's interesting. Where do I report from? Okay, so I'm in Davis, California. It's a university town. It's boring. It's ordinary. Um, I don't feel I can learn much. That's my community, but it's not my network. So as a science fiction writer, my network, which is the world and all my connections in the world, the internet, but also my friends that are elsewhere that I'm in contact with through various mediated um, uh, methods, um, they teach me. And then I read. I read science news. I read nature briefing. I read the... Uh, First Comes Science, EOS Magazine from the uh, American Geophysical Union, very good. And people's um, books about these topics. So I, I'm reading that some people came from uh, Bill McKibben and uh, Betsy Colbert's talk up at Powell's. I, I, um, I read them and I read everything I can. Every, I think this is very common for all of us. Read widely and take in everything. So my image for myself as a novelist is, uh, it comes out of Bakhtin. It has to do with um, heteroglossia, many voices, uh, the polyvocal novel, so that um, it's not, novels aren't about self-expression, uh, except rarely. And since novels can be anything, I mean, they're, they're a novum, they're novel, they're new. It's not a genre like a play or a poem. A, a novel is a big, baggy, capacious thing. But there's one kind of novel that is um, a whole bunch of voices that are speaking in turn, like a Greek chorus. Well, I quite love that, and I've done that a lot. Not always, but but often. And and there's a, you know, I, uh, my wife and I watch Turner Classic movies, and so we're seeing the 30s, we're seeing the 40s. It's, it's more interesting than most um, a TV if you're vegging out at night. And there's the telephone operators, almost always women. And they're, they're plugging in. They got the big board. They got the, the, the plugs. They're plugging in. There's one voice plugging. They plug in and then there's another voice talking. And, and they're pulling out, plugging in. That I have thought of as the image of what I'm up to as the novelist and concocting novels like this one or 2312 or New York 2140. I mean, it... Uh, as I say, each novel kind of forces a different form upon me, but I really like that image of what I'm up to. And then the input is just like anybody else's input, but I, but I don't do much social media. I read online like everybody else, but I tend to read um, longer forms, and I like reading magazines that still come to my house. London Review of Books is crucial for culture. Um, science News is crucial for science. And then I tack on accordingly. Your uh, your image of the switchboard operator is—I mean, you should file that away. There may be a uh, 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 Ministry of the Future sort of a sort of avant-garde uh, sound piece uh, performance. That, I mean, it's there; it's there, ready to be made. And you know, someone's plugging in, and you hear the photon, and we hear from history, and we hear from Mary Murphy. You're great. Um, one more question on the on the sort of the the repertorial thing, um, and and maybe just a tiny bit more in the details. Again sort of for my own benefit, um, there's this great old phrase, it's kind of out of circulation now, but I, I always loved it. Um, journalists used to say they would save string. A journalist would be saving string. And it's somebody who's on a beat um, and they have a feeling that a set of things is gonna turn into a story, but it's not there yet, but they, they're they gonna take note. It's sort of that that magpie impulse. And I think that's familiar to, to writers of all kinds. You mentioned that, that your encounter with the sort of, you know, 
reality of wet bulb 35 became this this piece of new information that you had to contend with and, and became the seed of this book how do you store those things that you learn um is it a, just a big stew in your brain is it do you have a system um what is the what is the, sort of the kim stanley robinson database for for all the stuff that you just discussed i don't know um it's project based that's what i would that's what i would say is that i don't re really gather string randomly um and i'm reading i'm paying attention to the world i'm trying to ignore the world oftentimes the i feel like for instance in our our recent political crises and the last four years that there's a kind of a soap opera a bad soap opera, a, a dreadful soap opera that is uh, forcing itself on everyone's attention. And then I'm always trying to avert my eyes and think, you know, what's going on in material sciences? Are we making any advances in cadmium uses or, um, you know, um, superconduction at room temperature? And trying to pay attention to a, a tide that is under the soap opera, that's under the radar, and, and that is marching on in interesting and one might hope progressive ways despite the soap opera. And that's one another reason to stay off of social media. Uh, it makes me less crazy, but, and also I'm paying attention to, I'm hoping the tides that are real and are uh, crucial to history going forward that maybe aren't being reported or aren't being uh, thrown in our face as the supposedly important stuff. And it has to be admitted that the soap opera often includes a crucial uh, history, but it's just too um, ugly and volatile, and there were, might be more interesting things going on under the radar. But then the project-based part is this. I get an idea, I finally, I talk it over with my editor, Tim Holman at Orbit Books, and he, you know, rolls his eyes and says, give it a try, and usually gives me excellent advice as to how to make it more grounded and uh, successful as a novel. A stupendous help from my editor Tim, I'm lucky that way. That's been six books now. And then I get rolling and then it's like magnified, magnet, ma magnetized in that um, then information is either irrelevant to my project or it's crucial to my project. And, and it is kind of stumbling along. It would be like the reporter walking down the street. All kinds of things are coming in, but only some some of that stuff coming in will be relevant to the novel and boy, oh my God, it's like, how did that show up right now when it's the perfect piece that I need to build this brick wall? And it's a, it's a brick in the wall. And I'm stumbling along finding bricks and a, a year or two will pass during which I'm in a process of, of discovery that feels quite magical because um, it's not very directed or targeted. It is indeed like the, the that's when I can recognize that the pieces of the string are, are gonna be useful or not. So, um, I want to dive into one one modular piece of that um, because it's so is one that happens to be deeply interesting um, to me as well. Um, the uh, you know it'd be easy to call this novel climate fiction, and and I'm sure a person could or should. Uh, to me, it was financial fiction or financial science fiction. I mean, this is a hugely magnetic and interesting, and I think actually very very new um, part of it because there's not many books of any genre that take that that machinery, particularly the machinery of, of central banking as seriously as as ministry for the future does um so i i'm super into this because i i don't think i'm alone in this i'm a little preoccupied with central banks these days they seem to be one of the holdouts of at, at least effective kind of like technocratic institutions in the developed democracies and interesting for that reason uh so i i have to know how did you come to write a novel that has so many scenes full of central bankers, an unprecedented number. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a little crazy, right? But it's the science fiction always has what Darko Suvin called the novum, the new thing, like the rocket ship or the time travel device, the novum in the science fiction novel that uh, springs the new story. And so in this case, it is indeed the central banks. And, and, um, and I like that because it is pretty damn new for novels to be um, focused in on that part of human life. But here's how I came to it, uh, a couple of different directions, but the main one was this. Um, we're in a global capitalist system, neoliberal capitalism. Capital, and let's just say money, goes 
to the highest rate of return. This is almost like water running downhill. Money will, investment money will go to the highest rate of return and it seeks to find that and it goes to that. And so um, if the highest rate of return goes to cutting down a hardwood forest in Chile and turning it into toilet, toilet paper for Japan, the money will go to that process uh, and so on and so forth. So if, in fact, if that got you 7% return and um, growing a forest in the Northwest in one of those empty blanks of land in the Pacific Northwest got you a 5% return, the money would go to the 7% return. And these are, there are humans making these decisions, but really it's an algorithm. It's an overriding algorithm that you've got to make the highest rate of return. Profit is an index like a heat index, like a wet bulb temperature. Profit brings all kinds of factors into one number and then you say, oh good, it's the highest profit. Now, saving the biosphere is not the highest rate of return. Um, in fact, it, it sometimes looks like a just a plain old cost. Not only do you not profit from it, but you have to pay money to get nothing done. In fact, uh, uh, Betsy Colbert's new book that they were talking about up at Powell's makes this sentence. Why, who's going to pay $100 billion per year for a product that nobody wants, uh, which is to say CO2 grabbed out of the atmosphere in her case. So that being the situation, we are doomed. The biosphere is going to crash. We're going to be a mass extinction event. Um, civilization will then go down. There will be food shortages, refugee crises, is a general war of all against all. And the Pentagon report on climate change is titled um, "All Hell Breaks Loose." So uh, even the Pentagon doesn't like this scenario because they're charged with defending the United States. So then it, it begins to look like a financial problem, right? We are not uh, in a system that is going to pay us to do the right things. Um, some people get paid and everybody else has to work to make a living doing the wrong things for the biosphere. And so we are so screwed. And this accounts for the desperate feelings, the, the frustration, the despair, the pessimism, the giving upness, um, what Michael Mann calls doomism, that already at the point we're in right now, this night of uh, 2021, um, there's nothing we can do going forward because we're doomed. Well, that's not actually true um, uh, physically, technologically, but socially, financially, it's kind of true. And so uh, I guess the, what I would finish with here is central banks make money for their governments, fiat money, official money, like US dollars. So this is not a cryptocurrency. It's the central banks, they're charged with um, um, uh, coining money, introducing money into the system. And they've done some really famous quantitative easings. So in 2008 and in 2020, last year, uh, and now um, the Biden administration, hopefully gonna uh, put another $2 trillion into the system. Quantitative easing is essentially the introduction of new money into the world economy. And if it doesn't cause inflation or deflation, the point would be that the central banks, if they were directed to by legislatures, could then um, make the first payment of that money out for sequestering carbon. So then you could say, you know, something like five to seven trillion dollars was introduced between 2008 and 2010. Nothing happened to deflation or inflation. Um, if, if that much money were being given to um, decarbonization, which would really be almost a full employment program also, like a works project administration, that first spending of money would um, reverse the valence on the, the um, slippery slope to doom that our financial system now has us on. It would introduce another vector. It would take away the one rule that, the one ring that rules them all, one ring that binds them, which is uh, profit rules. So that, so I had to get interested in central banks and I ran into some very good sources of information on that and then, you know, tried to tell the story. The, um, yeah, in, uh, uh, inflation in particular, um, I uh, have long felt is sort of this uh, skeletal hand, the skeletal fearsome hand still grasping us from like the year 1972. And and weirdly, again, these connections are interesting because I think when people hear about inflation or monetary policy, they don't think about 
global warming and the environment, but they ought to, because um, it might in fact be one of the most still sort of malevolent forces um, arrayed against, um, you know, big projects like that. Uh, I want to ask you about California, because of course we're chatting here thanks to the great um, Point Reyes bookstore in situated in one of the most beautiful locations, probably of any independent bookstore in the United States. Um, and of course, California, you know, features in, in much of your fiction. Uh, and I know it's, is and, and has been hugely meaningful to you, not only in writing, but, but in your life. Um, it plays an interesting role in this book. It was interesting to me because um, some action kind of passes through California. Uh, it's, it's mentioned, kind of the, the, the status of, of this place is mentioned. But it's not, it's not in the center ring. It's not in the spotlight. Um, every time, I will say, every time it was mentioned, I, I read the passage aloud to my partner because it was, I mean, it was the, the thrilling, these little almost, um, almost like, like caught reflections you would catch in a mirror, you know, or around a corner of this place and what it was doing. It was, it was an exciting vision. Um, so I was wondering if, may, if maybe you could talk about, both in the context of the, of the fictional world of the book, but perhaps also in the real context of our world, what role do you think California has to play in all of this and you know the next the next 20 years the trembling 20s and beyond yeah well i have i'm a californian and i uh, love the state and i'm proud of it as a progressive state um that said being in the world economy in the neoliberal order um we have a multicultural um uh progressive social uh, and political body here in California that is also struggling with um, intense inequality and um, uh, poverty. So uh, that's um, alarming and embarrassing to the point where it's interesting to try to figure out if California enmeshed in the global capitalist order could nevertheless carve a progressive path that solved uh, problems here in ways that might be exemplary for other places. So um, in my novel, that, that's a more of a worldwide question. What happens in California is the creation of a, a biosphere health program that has to do with uh, things that I've been following here uh, related to uh, Sigma, the, the, um, the, um, uh, what is it even stand for? Sustained Integrated uh, Management, Groundwater Management Act, uh, SIGMA, that uh, a law passed that basically makes uh, groundwater in the Central Valley a kind of a commons and begins to price it properly and begins to bank it. And there's some really cool hydrological plans that struck me as wonderful that essentially the floor of the Central Valley is like as hard as a parquet floor. Um, but it's dirt running down literally eight miles deep. It's a kind of a tectonic fault cleft uh, filled with dirt such that there's a stupendous amount of water stored in the in the Central Valley. And when you have floods, you would when you have atmospheric rivers hit in California, um, what you would want is to, for that water not to drain out the Golden Gate in a giant brown flood, but to be uh, held on the land long enough to sink down into the uh, groundwater and replenish the groundwater, then it could be pumped out in droughts, et cetera. Uh, help to, California's incredibly uh, plumbed hydroscape. It's a kind of a terraformed world, California, when it comes to water management. And it turns out that the valley floor has areas that are um, etched canyons as deep as Yosemite Canyon that are on the valley floor from the end of the ice ages when um, the glaciers melted and flooded off the Sierras into the Essential Valley, cut these stupendous canyons, well, 300 feet deep and, 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 and as wide, and they filled up with boulders and dirt so that when you drive the Central Valley, it's as flat as a pool table in all directions for 400 miles by 50 miles, a, a bizarre feature on this earth. Um, but some parts of it are permeable to water and other parts aren't. And so it's like one hydrologist said, it's like French drains. It's like enormous natural French drains. And if we um, uh, make arrangements with the farmers that own that land, or if we simply uh, exercise eminent domain and hold on to that land and dam water during flood times, then it'll sink down into the groundwater. All this was so cool. And it adds up to many other California plans. We're bringing back the Valley Oaks and the foothills around the Central Valley habitat corridors, trying to bring wildlife back into the Sierra, trying to um, um, 
make accommodations with the remaining um, indigenous, the, the California Native American tribes, and see what they know about their land that they can uh, pitch into this project uh, for all of us, et cetera. It was all, it's all very exciting, and it was the one place on earth that I knew the best. So the novel is global, and it goes all over. I mean, in a crazy way. It's based in Zurich, where my wife and I lived for two years, but it keeps coming for the financial meetings to uh, what my, one of my friends convinced me. I need to call it the big tower in San Francisco, that the name that it has now, which I'm not even going to mention, is just an advertising thing like a sale, uh, uh, you know, like an advertising thing that has been bought and that uh, 20, even 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we don't have to call it after that one company. It's a little offensive. So my friend said, get that out of the book. And so it's called the big tower. And we all know which tower it is because in San Francisco, it's just uh, dominating. And I went to a meeting on the top floor and it could not have been more astounding in terms of views. So I thought I've got to put it that's one of those threads that when you're in a meeting, I, I, would, I don't even know what meaning it was because I was just thinking about my novel. I have to confess, I have to confess on the point of Sigma specifically, um, when I read that, I spent a lot of time in the Central Valley um, and when I read that, it, to read it on the page, again, in a very sort of didactic, just really like breaking it down, presenting it very clearly kind of way. It was exciting to read. I went, wow, what a cool vision, you know? Like, that would, that's such a good idea thinking that it was one of the science fictions. And of course, I go to look it up online and find that it's real, um, which is always a sort of a, shock, a wonderful shock um, in a book like this that kind of treads that line between the real and the unreal. And I will, I'll actually direct um, people's attention. There's a wonderful question. So the second one down, I won't read the whole thing now because it's long, um, but it's a nice little um, reference to a, a map of regenerative projects worldwide that is another one of those things that is, um, you know, laced into the fiction of the book, but is in fact real. And there's there's a lot of those. Um, you know, think about California and, and hydrology and um, big projects. Um, one of the, for me, one of the truly greatest thrills of this book is the, the infrastructural sublime or the, just the, the fun of enormous, enormous work on like a mega scale. There's one project in particular that we keep returning to that is it sort of takes place on top of glaciers. And, and it's like, I don't want to spoil it actually for people who haven't read the book, but it's, it's phenomenal and it's inspiring and it's a big, very expensive project. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, there is a general lament um, in the United States and, and I think probably in some other developed democracies too, that we, air quotes, we um, are no longer able to do big projects. You know, we can't, we can't organize things on this scale in the way that we used to be able to. Um, and I'm curious to know um, if you, well, first of all, if you think that's true or, 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 or kind of, kind of not, I don't know, maybe articulated correctly. And either way, if what your diagnosis is, you know, when you, when you look at our world now and the, the big things we are or are not capable of, and we're going to have to get to, you know, be doing that work on top of the glaciers, what, like, what do you think is the gap? Um, well, I'm going to answer that because uh, in a way that also takes in a question that I'm seeing on the side over here that I think is extremely interesting from uh, Anna, because it does involve, uh, like we can't do it now like we used to, it does involve paying for it. And so it involves economics. And again, the neoliberal order privileges the private over the public. And so a lot of these big infrastructural projects can only be paid for by the by government because private industry isn't going to make a profit out of them. For instance, the interstate highway system in the United States in the 50s, and we did that no problem. China, in order to stimulate their economy, um, when the pandemic went in 2008 in the, in the real estate crash, they built um, some, I've heard figures that I, I shudder to contemplate, 20,000 miles of high-speed rail and just to keep their economy going. So uh, I would love to talk to one of these um, to mainstream economists. And indeed, I have talked with uh, Joseph Stiglitz and with uh, Danny Kahneman. Uh, the, um, and these are two major liberal economists. Um, and um, it's a little alarming because a lot of what I'm talking about can simply be described as Keynesianism coming back again. They understand that, they they would agree with that. They, If they are liberal economists, they're basically Keynesian anyway, and opposed to the Milton Friedman, uh, anti-government, private over everything, neoliberalism. Um, and, 
And so MMT, modern monetary theory, is a kind of a neo-Keynesianism that insists on uh, making up new money in quantitative easing and not worrying about it, like Keynes would say, to stimulate a broken uh, um, economic system like in the Depression. Uh, but also combined very importantly with full employment, that you would use this new money to pay people and that the government would be the employer of last resort. And then you would reduce wage pressure, which means fear in working people. You would you would get, give everybody adequacy and it would, and it's a kind of a, um, a, a really good looking idea that MMT people insist is just as important as quantitative easing at will. So, okay. I can follow that. And really, I'm an English major. I follow this stuff at the level of um, I've given myself the best education I've ha I can, and I've had some tremendous help from economists at um, UC Santa Cruz and in Australia. But what uh, disturbs me is that um, Stiglitz, Kahneman, and you can read Paul Krugman talking about this, saying, um, oh, MMT, you know, it just can't work, and I don't understand their objection to it. Why is it not just Keynesianism and we're in a bad way? Why are you making these objections as our, our best hope amongst mainstream economists? So if I had that kind of a discussion with um, a mainstream economist, which I would love to do, and um, it may happen because this book is being widely discussed uh, in, in quarters like that, I think I would have to end up being a kind of an interviewer, as so happen, happens with me. If I'm the telephone operator plugging it in, I would plug that guy in and listen to the, that person in and listen to them. And um, I would be interested to talk to the MMT um, uh, economists and, and basically get them in the same conversation and be the telephone operator between them, because that's my role as the novelist. And then, uh, but what I think is that with quantitative easing and with a belief in government as being a good force, the people's company, a necessary force, and indeed always uh, support public over private, just always, that's the uh, essence of leftism in America. Um, I think we can do these big projects, especially now that we get desperate and it's do these projects or be in terrible trouble. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll go over to the um, questions that have accrued from um, everyone tuned in here. So um, this is your chance. If you have something that's occurred to you, go and drop it in there and also um, go in and cast your vote um, for what you'd like to hear Kim Stanley Robinson respond to. Um, I don't know if this is an obvious question or not, but it's, it is a, a interesting one, especially given the, the kind of, um, I don't know, the way this book's, I, I presume it's creation and then publication have kind of um, you know, been laid across this this fissure in the world and the economy, uh, the way we live, the way we think about global affairs, the way we do book events, you know, they're all online and it's, it is all sort of pandemic. I'm just curious to know, um, you you went through this process of, of imagining and, and gathering all the string and, and formulating it. Um, and then there was this this great rupture. How has the pandemic um, changed your 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 view of this particular of this future in particular the the future of the ministry for the future um, and and maybe just the, the climate thing in general. I well, I wrote this book in 2019, and so it was done in say January of 2020, and I turned it in, and it was in the phase of being copy edited when the pandemic struck, and I thought, oh my gosh didn't see that coming. I was as stunned as anyone else. In fact, I was on a, a rafting trip in the Grand Canyon with a group of uh, geology students from UC Davis. And we were out of touch with the world for like nine days. And these were the first, uh, well, from say March 4th to March 14th. So when we came out, it was stunning how much had changed in that week. That was when the shutdown happened. We came up and we we passed people going down as we came up and they said, you're not even going to believe it. We're not even going to waste our time trying to describe it to you. Get up to the top, check your iPhones. You're going to be amazed. And we were. So um, I put some, in the last phase, I put in the copy edited copy of Ministry for the Future, a couple of notes of the, the, the events of 2020. I didn't try to incorporate the pandemic in the novel. It was impossible. And besides, my novel is concerned with approximately 2025 to somewhere in the 2050s, covers about 30 years. I tried to uh, obscure from myself and 
eventually I put in a little clues along the way as to what date you're really at in the book, but I wanted that to be a little fuzzball um, for reasons I'm not quite sure of, but it seemed right to me. So the pandemic, when it really, when I realized how far we were in it and that the novel was going to come out in October, I thought, well, who knows? Uh, 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 it was like an experiment where I could not predict the result. Would people read it and go, well, this is so unrealistic because the pandemic changes everything and he didn't know that? Or are people reading this novel now with the stronger realization that things can change fast? And I think the latter is kind of proving true that now when people read Ministry of the Future, it's not a science fiction novel. It's like, oh, this is uh, starting from right now and things are getting really weird world civilization is one civilization and all of us are in this uh, on this same planet together struggling to um, get into balance with the biosphere and now we know that and i uh, i was asked to write an essay um for the new yorker where i i um this i think spoke to a lot of people a lot of people um, read that essay that had never read my work before because science fiction is a bit of a niche audience in terms of who will accept to try to read it. That's less and less true now, but nevertheless, what's happened in the pandemic is that somehow um, it has uh, focused the impact of, of many things, but, and amongst them is this novel. I think that's right. I still remember it's it's faded a little bit, which is a which is a shame. But um, that sense in the early days, just the the total disruption, and you know, the news came out that uh, there would be no evictions, you know, or and then in some cases, things <laughs> things as as fu foundational uh, to the world order as rent would be suspended. Um, and and there's something about that that is sort of a permission slip to think in bigger ways and and think in the in the ways that the Ministry for the Future I think wants you to think. Um, with that, let's go to, we've got a, a great a line of questions here, not too many, but we'll we'll try to get some of these in here um, from the audience. Um, the one that got the most votes, and I, so I think there's a lot of interest in this, um, it's a little technical. Um, uh, Lee notes that you write a lot about carbon pricing, different forms of sort of different markets for carbon and different ways of pricing and, and paying for carbon in the book, but we don't hear much about it from the new administration. Um, so what do you think is the, the real, world, real world role of carbon pricing? going forward from here? Um, it, I think it's crucial. It, you could call it uh, paying the true cost of carbon. And um, Michael Mann and other people have helped me to um, understand that if we were to tack on a tax that paid for the true cost of burning a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, it would be stupendous. Uh, it would be a sudden taking on of an externalization economically that would be huge. Um, and it might, um, like many things, might kind of uh, crash the economy. We're, but we're already in a depression that is being staved off by um, giving money to the corporations and the rich so that they feel happy enough to continue to keep uh, liquidity going. It's not a good solution. It's leaving. One of the things that we've learned from the pandemic, people like your um, your trash collectors or your grocery store workers, uh, like my son, as I said in the essay, are crucial to the running of civilization, but they didn't get, they, they might not get evicted, but they didn't get a raise in pay to be to the point of, of living adequacy. They are not getting paid a living wage, even though they're crucial to all of our lives. So things are still badly messed up. Um, then, um, well, a carbon tax, progressive. The more you burn, the more you pay. It could be called a fee bait in the sense that um, taking in that tax at the federal level and making it progressive and, and, and even publishing a schedule that shows it's going to grow over time and get in a heavier hit over time. So businesses take on that information and begin to quickly decarbonize. Um, if there's a fee bait aspect to it, to where the citizens are getting paid back, then suddenly they might be at adequacy. Uh, some version of a universal basic income in effect that is being created out of the tax money rather than just quantitative easing. Um, and then also the removal of all subsidies for fossil fuels. I mean, we're still uh, paying our, paying people ourselves to poison ourselves. The removal of that is like a tax. It's an incentive, as economists would say, so that um, 
Uh, and then the creation of a carbon coin, the, uh, this quantitative idea that's in the novel that I took from the literature, that if you were to sequester a, a ton of carbon, that you would get one carbon coin. So it would be a kind of a gold standard. If you did good things to the world by sequestering carbon or not burning it when you had it, you would get paid accordingly. So then you'd be getting paid to do the right things rather than the wrong things. So um, I'm in favor of all of it. And I think people have chickened out on that. Um, the Biden administration has been fabulous in their climate plans, but um, I think they're also trying to take it one step at a time. So they need to get that stimulus passed. And then um, if it comes, if a carbon tax comes up at some point and has to get rammed through, I wouldn't be surprised. The Paris Agreement, our, 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 our commitments under the Paris Agreement, like all other countries, are going to, they're forcing everybody to cut a carbon burning faster than is at all comfortable. So it's going to be an all hands on deck situation in terms of, of, of forcing that change in the, in the economic and financial sense. In the, in the book, in the implementation of the carbon coin, there's a very bracing um, sequence of events where some of these states that own huge, you control huge untapped reservoirs say, okay, we'll take it. We pledge not to, not to extract this stuff. Now, please give me my, you know, 17 trillion carbon coins. And it's, it's quite, it actually makes you uncomfortable reading it because they're like, they're kind of not the good guys. They're, it's sort of shitty. They're, they're, why do they get to be rich? Um, and I think that muddling of good and bad and, you know, sort of virtuous, people saving the earth and the bad people, you know, sort of, you know, dumping toxic waste in the river, like in the old Captain Planet cartoon show is, is interesting and useful. And, and it was challenging to read, um, for me at least. Um, there is a fun question from Mark and I, I read it and I realized that I wanted to know the answer very badly myself as well. Um, he says, looking at the cover of the book, he realized that it's not depicting a scene that he remembers. And I think that I could also not say what is happening on the cover of the book. So, um, what is it? What's uh, what's pictured in the on the cover of Ministry for the Future? I don't know. <laughs> I guess I would say um, I had to puzzle over it. Um, the the light at the end of the tunnel. That there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and so you know the art department at Orbit they've been fabulous for the six books I've done with them, and I don't have anything to do with it. I I look at these covers, I go, yay, good for you, um, and and a couple of them have been stunningly good and have probably sold more copies of the book than anything else. Um, and so in this case, I think it must be the light at the end of the tunnel, but I don't know. <laughs> that's great. That's very, that's very pure. It's just, uh, it's just, you know, yeah, science fiction. Um, here's a good question. And I'm going to follow it up with a, with a follow on my own as we, as we kind of go towards the conclusion here. Um, uh, someone, an unnamed uh, sort of glitch bat asks, um, who in your opinion is at the forefront of this whole sustainability movement? Um, uh, yeah, like who's, who should we be looking at? When, when we sort of, you know, if we're, we have our compass and we're trying to tune it and figure out which way to go, we're reading <laughs> Kim Stanley Robinson, what are, who are two or three other people, writers and or practitioners who we ought to just really be paying attention to and, and listening to closely at this moment? Uh, um, I, I, Ursula Le Guin, <laughs> um, Ian Banks. I don't know. I'm thinking this is a little retrospective and nostalgic for my um, lost, lamented um, um, co-utopianists in the science fiction field. Um, I, I'm. I follow the people um, in nonfiction. I don't read a whole lot of science fiction because I don't want to scare myself by finding out how strange my books are. And the less I know, the better I can write without uh, fear of, of, of being idiosyncratic to the point of craziness. And I don't want to know that. So I'm a little ignorant. I like... Um, um, I like the Afrofuturists. I like uh, Cory Doctorow's work. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction. The people there, I mean, McKibben and um, uh, Betsy Colbert, but also uh, Naomi Klein, she's been good. But I saw one of the side questions talking about the um, sort of the bottom up level of these restoration and um, landscape restoration and wildlife helper projects, uh, essentially your own watershed, your own bioregion, your own um, 
biosphere community that you're in. And I, that list, I think it's chapter 85, is taken from a Google map of, of real places that uh, real projects that have got a YouTube. That was the organizing principle. Somebody scrolled through YouTube, found all the landscape restoration projects they could and plugged it into a map. And I just read it off from top to bottom. And in the audio book of Ministry of the Future, it takes about 12 minutes to read that with accents from all over the world. So that was really plugging in the telephone thing. I think these bottom-up things are crucial and important. And I wouldn't want to emphasize any I mean, this novel is kind of top down because it's about international finance and about central banks and it's set in Zurich and it's the international UN community. So that's top down in a way. And we need that badly. This is where I would say um, all the good little projects will get eaten by neoliberalism, uh, you know, bought up the way the big five tech companies buy up a great little startup and then you're just part of the machine. So you need a top down solution. You need the bottom up. And crucially, there's an in between the side to side the way cities organize with each other, the way like 100 million people in America are living in cities that have already made agreements at the city level to um, zero out their carbon as soon as possible. So, um, you don't, and also there's no dichotomy there. If I write a novel about top down, that doesn't mean I don't believe in bottom up. It's just that a novel is not the whole world. Even though I sometimes try to uh, imitate or create the affect state of an entire world as a, a kitchen sink novel and you're reading it and going, God, this has everything in it. And then you think, but wait, why isn't there, for instance, direct air capture? This was another question. What's not in the book that ought to be? We ought to have um, direct air capture sucking carbon dioxide out of the air and it should be an industry like cars or iPhones where we're gonna have to make tons of them uh, um, uh, literally perhaps millions of them just to suck carbon out of the air so that we don't torch the uh, biosphere. So in the attempt to, um, in what is, it's a, another image of, of this particular novel is like a juggling act. I got a lot of balls in the air. I'm juggling like crazy. And then I see something important that like say a new Gaia religion, which is kind of made a joke of in this novel, it ought to be in there. It's important. It's like somebody's like throwing a, a running chainsaw at me to juggle that along with everything else. I'm going, oh God, I'm just going to let that one drop to the floor because all I can handle here is a tennis ball, not a, a, a running chainsaw while I'm juggling 40 objects already. So, um, so th the book is a mess, uh, but novels are made to be messy. And I don't mean to put it down when I say the book is a mess. I, I wanted that in fact, as an aesthetic effect. And I'm at a stage in my career where um, 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 I, let's just say challenging my readers with strangeness is part of the fun of, of, uh, of what I do. Uh, I think I think the um, picture of this avant-garde art project with the sort of audio feeds and the switchboard operators coming is really coming into view now because we'll also have someone throwing lit torches and chainsaws and there'll be some sort of a we'll get some Cirque du Soleil but it's, uh, this is this is going to work. Um, I see Stevens back in. I just want to close out. Um, uh, Ken Stanley Robinson, you got the pleasure of reading um, one of these wonderful passages. You know, you in in your book you you bring in the voices of uh, un sort of expected. Characters, uh, a photon, the sun, uh, the blockchain, you know, gets a little mini chapter to introduce itself. And of course, one of them is history. Um, and uh, for my part, um, to close this out and to thank you, I want to read just the, the tiniest uh, bit of it myself because I love it so much. Um, I happen in the present, but am told only in the future. And then they think they speak of the past, but really they are always speaking about the present. I do not exist, and yet I am everything. You know what I am. I am history. Now make me good. Now make me good. Thank you, Kim Stanley Robinson, for this very important book. And thank you, Stephen, and Poirier's books. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody, for dropping in into this Zoom world, which is, um, you know, it's better than nothing. <laughs> and it's pretty damn, in some ways, it's... Um, <laughs> It's 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 what we've got, and it might be that new part of the network that is going to even continue after we get post-pandemic, and that might be good. That might be um, lower carbon burn and and connectivity across the world. So who knows? But thank you.
I couldn't agree more as someone who thrives on having people gather together, you know, in, in Toby's barn and Point Reyes Station. We also have this this occasion here um, to have so many of you join us and to, to kind of, in, in some ways it feels like we're eavesdropping in on this amazing conversation about this incredible book. Um, and with an, such an informed audience, I've just been amazed watching the chat throughout uh, of the level of engagement and things that you, you feel differently in this environment. Um, Stan, Rob, Robin, thank you so much. Like I said, the book, we have it at the store. The button is below you there. We have signed book plates available. This is my commerce pitch, right? I have to do this part. Um, but again, we couldn't do this without all of you. Um, and I, it was real, a real honor um, to be able to host uh, these two gentlemen tonight. Um, thank you all. And we will. this will be available on YouTube. I'll get it um, up in the next day or two. So it will be available for repeat viewing. I, I was furiously scribbling notes. And I feel like I'll be doing more of that on the, the second watch. Um, and with that, I'll say good night to everyone. Thank you again. Um, and let's do this in person sometime down the line.